Dennis, why don't we get started? Good afternoon, I'm Dennis Kalecki, and welcome to the 409th Imagine Buffalo program and another great virtual Imagine lecture hosted by our Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. Now, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this program is created by the Center for the Study of Art and Architecture, History and Nature, uh, or Cezanne as I pronounce it, uh, and ImagineLifelongLearning.com. Now we're going to start with our speaker shortly, but first, a little housekeeping. Everyone watching will be muted, uh, muted during our speaker's presentation, which will last about 15 minutes or so. We'll have time for questions at the end. And if you do have a question, please type it into the chat box and we will get to as many as we can. This program is being recorded. You'll be able to watch it again later on the library's Facebook and YouTube channels and share the link with your friends and networks. As a reminder, Life Willing will be here on Zoom every Tuesday at 12.30 p.m. Same link with a great lineup of local speakers. Now, today is the third Tuesday of the month. So our focus is on history and future. And our theme is to imagine uh, uh, Greater Buffalo as a premier cultural and nature center. Therefore, we imagine place-based lifelong learning. It's a great uh, time. Uh, since it's our theme of history and future, to look back so we can better understand and imagine our future. And it fits in nicely with the themes for celebrating Erie County's 200th anniversary. That started in April and will run all the way through next April. Our featured speaker today is Shane Stevenson. Shane currently serves as the Director of Museum Collections at the Buffalo and Erie County Naval and Military Park. He is the author of two books, Buffalo's East Side Industry, which we'll hear about next October. And today we'll be looking at the Larkin Company and in a special dimension, uh, the social reformer dimension of the Larkin Company. Shane also serves as the vice president of the board of trustees of the Buffalo Presidential Center and owner of Archives in the Buff, a small company that works with families and businesses to help archive their records. He previously spent five years at the Buffalo History Museum as a library and archive technician. So now let's welcome Shane Stevenson. Shane? Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. And thank you to Dennis and Melissa and the gang. Um, uh, that puts on these Imagine series. And what I love is the diversity, Dennis. So you, you've encapsulated, you know, as you said, art, architecture, nature, history, and they're really, uh, the topics are very, are pretty fascinating. So thank you for having me again, and I appreciate it. Uh, okay, so hello to everybody uh, from the USS Little Rock. I'm actually at work today on my lunch hour. So uh, sitting in my office here on uh, CLG4, and uh, so we're going to talk a little bit, as Dennis had mentioned, about uh, the social welfare programs that the Larkin Company created. Uh, given the, the 20, 15, 20, 25 minute time span that we have for the Imagine series, uh, doing a general history of Larkin, the Larkin Company would uh, just probably extend out beyond that a little bit. So I decided to focus on one area. And this is an area that um, I've talked about before, uh, but it doesn't get as much attention as, say, the whole general um, the the whole general history of the company. So, uh, okay. So I do have a, a presentation. Let me let me just get this up here. Hopefully, this will work. Okay. Play from start. Are we good there? I think, oh, okay. 
All right, Social Welfare and the Larkin Company. And again, thank you to all for uh, being here today. This is a, a fabulous uh, venue. So I'm gonna talk, a, <laughs> can't ignore it. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the fascinating Larkin Company and it was a fascinating company uh, and its rise was as quick as its fall. And uh, it's just such an interesting uh, part of the Buffalo industrial fabric. Uh, so here we see, uh, we've got Albert Hubbard on the top and John Larkin on the bottom. And uh, the company was opened in uh, 1875 by 30 year old John Larkin. So he had already worked uh, for his brother-in-law, Justice Weller, for about 10 years prior to opening the Larkin Company. Uh, he met Albert Hubbard uh, and they created those, uh, they had those creative sparks. Uh, and that was John Larkin's brother. Uh, John Larkin's wife's brother. So uh, Francis Larkin uh, was uh, Hubbard and she brought her brother Albert along uh, to back to Buffalo from Chicago. Uh, they're well known for the Larkin idea. Okay, so the Larkin idea had different renditions uh, and it started as you see there on the, the, say the third bullet point, they created a combination box in 1885 uh, and they sold about 147 products, which at that time was mostly uh, uh, like laundry soap, uh, a bar or flakes of laundry soap. And then they would include other uh, cleaning products and toilet soaps like bar soaps today. And uh, at first they had a $6 combination box and then they expanded it out to a $10 combination box. Now, the combination boxes were great. They were selling anywhere between 95 and 100,000 of those a year, uh, up for about 10 to 12 years after they actually created the combination box. But they were finding when one family purchases that many products, uh, they only need to buy once a year, right? So they weren't, they, they wanted to increase their repeat customer base and certainly expand. Uh, through all of America, large cities, small towns, uh, farms, villages. And so then they came up with what we kind of now know is the real Larkin idea of creating uh, Larkin secretaries and they would create clubs in their own neighborhood. All right, so that was established around 1900. So the combination box did great for about 15 years, but this allowed them to get into more homes, and certainly it was factory to family, right? So uh, that was their motto, going directly to the home. And uh, so it allowed them to expand into various neighborhoods and to get that repeat business because the Larkin secretaries and her clubs of other women who lived around her uh, would put in a monthly order or by monthly order, depending, but they would put in multiple orders a year. And then depending on the size of their order, they would then get a premium, right? So that was the real, that was the real catch there. That was the snag, the marketing snag, so to speak, where if they purchased a $10 order, that would go, the products would go to the whole club, that $10 would give them a certain premium that would then be shared or uh, given in turn one a month to each of the uh, members of the club. If you had a $20 order, that would give you a little better premium, of course, because you're spending more money. So the way the premiums could be bought outright or they could be bought uh, by purchasing other household, what they would call products. Don't want, I can't get much deeper into that, but uh, so at their height, they had about 90,000 secretaries throughout the country. And at least through the clubs alone, they had about 2 million customers that would be ordering most likely every month from the Larkin Company. Fabulous photograph here. I always love this photograph and it's in the book. Uh, this is the Larkin employees in 1883. Uh, so three people that I'd like to potentially highlight there. Darwin Martin is the second from right. So you'll see the little boy, uh, 
you know, leaning against the wall. The next gentleman over standing on the ground is a very young Darwin Martin. And he became so integral to the company for the rest of his life. Uh, the other uh, people that I'd like to highlight are the Koss brothers. They were from Philadelphia and they stayed with the company for 33 years. And Daniel is right of, over Darwin's shoulder. He's got like a Kepi hat on and a really large mustache, right? So he became the head of shipping and receiving for the company and organizing all those logistics. And William is the taller gentleman on the back row right below the fan in the window. So he obviously got the blonde hair <laughs> from the family and uh, Daniel's a, a little darker there. But so I just wanted to highlight that. If you'll see that most of the employees at this time uh, are young females. And as has been discussed in prior presentations, girls got a job very quickly. And then even by the time they were 16 and 17, uh, they were married and then they potentially didn't work anymore. So uh, this gave them a few years of uh, skills. All right, so the beginnings of the company, uh, they started at 196 through 198 Chicago Street, uh, down there in the old First Ward. Uh, that's a stylized picture in the upper left of the 3,000 square foot building. And very soon, uh, because they were expanding so rapidly, they moved to the footprint that we now know. Uh, and this is a wonderful shot uh, looking across Seneca Street uh, into what would become the 701 Seneca building. And so this is the most east corner. So the closest corner to downtown. Uh, it's now Larkin Street and Seneca Street. But this was the collection of buildings that was beginning uh, in 1877 uh, to what we comprise the Larkin footprint today. Uh, so as I had mentioned a little bit in the more detailed uh, history than I wanted to give almost, uh, by 1920, that was the height of the company, the high watermark of the company. Uh, the, as I mentioned, they had about 2 million customers. Uh, they, had, they were doing about $23 million in sales which as you can see under number one, that's about $340 million uh, in today's money. They had 2,600 workers in Buffalo and throughout the branches throughout the country, they had about 4,800 in total. So certainly at that time uh, and their rapid growth around 1900, uh, they were one of the largest companies in Buffalo at that time too. All right, uh, two years later though, changes uh, in women's rights uh, women have gotten the right to vote a few years earlier. Uh, they want to be seen as more than just uh, housewives. And certainly they are integral, uh, an integral part of the workforce during World War I. And so women weren't as active, so to speak, in uh, the household, all right? They were doing other things with their lives. Uh, the growth of the automobile made, uh, you know, mail order almost passe. Now that stores like Woolworths, uh, grocery stores, they're becoming nationalized around this time. And people, instead of waiting for a week and a half to get their products uh, shipped by rail, they would just be able to go to a store uh, down the street with their automobile. And so this really, Larkin didn't recognize these uh, social changes uh, quickly enough, say, whereas the Sears and Roebuck did. Uh, so through number three, they start, uh, you know, John Larkin dies, his kids take over. Uh, and around from 1925 to 1941, they begin selling their buildings. The one thing they have is a lot of space, right? So they become a warehouse concern. They stop manufacturing all of the products around 1941. And they fully close in 1967 when they sell their RST building. Uh, which is now the uh, Larkin uh, Exchange Building, uh, to graphic controls in 1967 and shuttering the Larkin footprint. All right, so the roots of social welfare really happened because of the growth of the employee base. 
So what we have is you have a lot of immigrants coming in at that time all across America, all right? And you can see the growth of employees. So that photograph a few uh, slides ago was from two years prior to 1895, or no, I'm sorry, 13 years prior to 1895. And in that photo, there might be 40, 50 people. Now they have 150, then they grow to 1,000. Then they, in those seven years, they add another 1,300 workers. And so by 1907, they've got 2,300. And again, there are a lot of uh, different languages are being spoken. Cliques are being formed based around ethnic background, which uh, is normal. And so the management team says, well, we're not building an employee community. We're not building uh, what we'd like to build here because everyone's just going off in their different directions and forming cliques based around their common language. Uh, so they decided to try to institute uh, some programs that and initiatives that would bring the employees back together again. Uh, Sixty-four percent of the workforce was uh, young single women. Uh, certainly, running the thread that runs through the management team uh, with William Heath is kind of a religious zeal, globalism, community, uh, you know, hard work endures and it pays off. So they have, in, in my book, I list the chapters uh, based on phrases that were in uh, the, lar that were carved into the Larkin administration building, talking about global cooperation, um, humanity, fraternity, you know, those ideals that uh, the company really put forward on a very visible scale. Uh, in 1897, John, uh, when he was in Chicago, witnessed the great uh, Chicago fire, uh, 1871, I think it was. And so he decided that he wanted to use the most up-to-date uh, building construction plans. So every building constructed after 1897 used, was up-to-date with, uh, with the fire codes of the time. And by 1900, they reduced the working day, as you can see, by uh, to nine hours for factory workers and eight and a half hours for office workers. So the Larkin administration building did create a disconnect as well uh, between the office workers and the factory workers. Uh, there are four categories here, financial, education, health, and leisure. <coughs> Excuse me. So under the financial initiatives, uh, you'll see a timeline running through and then arrow, you know, pointing up and down to the boxes. They established a Larkin benefit plan for the office employees, which was kind of like a life insurance, right? So they would get money, uh, and I'll show on the next slide uh, an example of that. Uh, and so all of these others, they did a home loan program where they would be the bank if you wanted to purchase a home. Right, and so all the others that you see along the line were like a cafeteria menu of based on life insurance, health insurance, uh, savings accounts. And so you can see the, with the thread running through there that they really promoted uh, their employees to save for the future. So as an example, as I mentioned, the benefit plan Right. Uh, by 1915, they had 1,415 members, which was, you know, more than half of the employees here in Buffalo. And so looking, doing the research for the book and using uh, Howard Stanger, who is a professor at uh, Canisius College, he did a lot of research into this uh, segment of the Larkin Company. Uh, for 20 cents a month, you would get, an employee would get $2.50 a week of coverage for health and a $50 death benefit. Uh, for 40 cents a month, you'll see $5 a week and a 75. And for $60, uh, 60 cents, sorry, 60 cents a month, you'd have $7.50 a week of health coverage uh, or you know, emergency funds and a $100 death benefit. All right, as I mentioned, the home loan program would help uh, with purchasing of a home or a building of a home. Uh, we don't know how much that was used because you had to prove that you at least had $500 in your savings account already. 
And so I'm sure very few employees had that much money saved up at that particular time. Uh, for education, all right, this is really focused on women. As I had mentioned, about 64% of the Larkin employees were women, young girls, and they were certainly coming right, well, either from Canada or from Ellis Island, you know, certainly some or many of them settled in Buffalo, as we know. Uh, and so they established a YWCA uh, right on campus there at, at the, in the Larkinville area. They had a dormitory, they had, they set up schools, uh, they had an in-house school. They partnered with the Erie County uh, Public Library and they had like a reading room. And so they really taught not like home economics. So not only ingratiating immigrants into the American way of life while they were working and earning an income, uh, but also preparing them for the future and getting married. So a lot of home ec classes. And uh, on the next slide, I'll show you an example of a week schedule. Here's uh, one of their classrooms from the uh, from one of the, from their building, right? So they had a they had a building right be between uh, the men's the auditorium and the Larkin Administration Building. But all of those, the two buildings, this building and the obviously the Larkin Administration Building are now gone. Uh, but the men's club is still there, and so this would have been where the parking lot is now, where people from M and T park and things like that. But uh, you can see the class schedule from 1910. On Monday, they taught uh, literature, how to make underwear and uh, gym class. Tuesday was cooking, embroidering, and swimming. Uh, Wednesday, and you can see on and on, China painting, shirt way, how to manufacture shirts, uh, millinery, the study of India. So that was pretty interesting that uh, they, uh, had they, had, they were able to study Hinduism and Eastern philosophy. And again, that was from uh, William Heath. Um, whose house is on, uh, whose uh, Frank Lloyd Wright house is on Soldier's uh, Circle there. Uh, then Bible, swimming, China painting, things like that. So, uh, so really bringing women immigrants up to speed with the American way of life, giving them a paycheck, and also giving them an education. Uh, and sorry, I'm, I, I know we're probably, how we're doing on time. Okay. Uh, in 1905, they hired a head nurse. Uh, you can see in 1906, they, the Larkin Administration Building after construction did have uh, restrooms, lounges, showers, and things like that for the office workers, right? Uh, in 1910, they contracted with the Buffalo Homeopathic Hospital, and they had one hospital bed room reserved exclusively for Larkin employees. They hired a practical nurse and physician in 1913. And in 1915, they hired a dentist, right? So they would duplicate these. They had the uh, factory and they had the office. And so these, off, these uh, medical facilities would be duplicated, uh, one for factory workers and one for uh, the office employees. Very interesting doing research for this. They would see about 2,000 uh, medical uh, visits or doctor visits throughout the year. So if there are 2,600 uh, employees in Buffalo, you're having 2,000 medical visits. That still shows you that they're not up to today's standards in terms of factory safety and things like that. One of the interesting things is that uh, they were assigned two employees a day to contact people who are out of work. So that was a really nice thing either through, you know, through a phone uh, they would contact the employees to see how they're doing. Uh, and then they expanded to home visits, right? They certainly were very proud of their uh, food selection. Uh, the cafeterias, uh, which were separated at one time, merged into the uh, factory across from uh, the Larkin Administration Building. And they were very proud of the food that they offered. Right? Oh, and there you go with the... Uh, 2,000 visits for minor injuries and 3,000 medical consultations. So that's more than one uh, per employee. Uh, for leisure, all right. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't bring up the time here. I, I don't want to be. Um, 
Shane, it's 12.55. Oh, boy. Okay. All right. <laughs> so we're, we're right up against it. I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, so for leisure, they had free coffee. Uh, they did place a piano. And in the later rendition, they had uh, an organ in the Larkin administration building. Uh, they held Christmas parties. They had outings. Uh, you know, they did a lot of team building. Uh, the Larkins would host them at Glen Cairn, which is their house in Canada. Sorry, I'm, I'm really rushing now. And I, I, knew I'd get a, I knew I'd get away from myself here. But uh, so those four areas, uh, this is a great thing. There was an inner office memo that they offered free coffee, but employees were stealing all the spoons that went with the coffee. So hopefully if they were silver, you know, certainly the employees may have been like we see today, you go to your employee lounge or something and there's no silverware, right? So this was something they would do back then. Again, I'm sorry, there's a little bit more, but we gotta, we gotta cut it short. Uh, but uh, let's see here. I also, um, so there's the book, you can reach me. Uh, and I'm also giving a walking tour, all right? So I've partnered with the, uh, the, the gentleman, Joel, who does the double-decker buses. Uh, in May 15th and 21st, if you go to that website, buffalohistorytours.com backslash buffalo slash walking slash tours, uh, you can buy a ticket and then we walk around the buildings and uh, we can get into this a little bit more then if you choose to. But thank you. I'm sorry, Dennis. Don't be sorry one bit. Uh, Ooh. Folks, we're going to uh, invite you to um, put in the chat room any questions you have. Uh, but let me begin because uh, is this th this idea of, of partnering and you giving a tour is an excellent one. I, I, uh, the, the more you think about Buffalo, the more the Larkin is, uh, and where we are today, the Larkin Company really <laughs> was a major component of our story. Uh, uh, the the wealth that was created, the the Darwin Martin House that were, uh, uh, you know, had really restored beautifully. Uh, and is central to our global outreach along with the uh, Albright Knox Gallery, uh, soon to be reopened, next year to be reopened. Uh, it really, our past truly has become our future of ourselves. So uh, you've highlighted that with, uh, with this presentation. Your book, how do folks easily get a copy of it? Is it physically out there? Uh, I've seen it sometimes at a Walgreens. Yes. Not, uh, not, not this particular one. I've never seen the Larkin Company. How do you how do you distribute your book? Uh, well, they people can reach out to me directly at my uh, email address, or they're certainly at uh, Barnes and Noble. I have seen them at Walgreens. The the brand, right? The Images of America series. Uh, and I've seen my East Side Industry book out a little bit more than the Larkin Company uh, on the racks at Walgreens, but. Uh, certainly, they they're sold on Amazon as well, and you know, bn.com, BarnesandNoble.com. Uh, and if I can step in here, we do have several copies at the library, so uh, people are definitely more than welcome to check it out from the library. That's right. That's right. That's Thank you very perfect, much. Melissa. Melissa, how are we doing for questions? We do have two questions. Let's uh, get well, we have three questions now. Uh, first question, if someone goes to the Larkin building, can they see any of the history or machinery displayed? Yes, uh, the, the buildings, especially the Larkin Exchange building, the RST building, the, uh, so they're under different ownership. Uh, 701 Seneca has the Eccles restaurant in it, the real large mammoth building. And that was the factory floor, uh, you know, where the, the main factory was. Certainly both buildings and then the RST building uh, was the terminal with the warehouse storage and then actual logistics shipping and receiving. Uh, there's certainly historical photographs all over the place uh, uh, in the hallways. Uh, there are some, some artifacts out that you can take a look at. And on the first floor of the 701 Seneca building, there is a Larkin gallery, right? So it's like a little museum. So they have a, a lot of different artifacts from very small bottles of uh, health products to furniture, you know, all of those 
premiums that they were building and constructing and manufacturing. It's 13 hours. Oh, I'm sorry. That was my, <laughs> that's my computer. Sorry, everybody. Uh, so the, uh, so the, the, you can walk around and you can get some insight into uh, potentially what it was like through the photographs and things like that. Next question. Do you believe the social net that Larkin provided had any impact on the reason they closed? Interesting question. Thank you uh, to the questioner. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, no, I, I, I don't think it was, you know, I don't think any of the programs were losing them money or anything like that, if that's what you mean. I Certainly, when the company started to downsize after 1922, and they started to lose all the female secretaries, uh, they had likewise shrunk the benefit programs that they had created. Uh, so I don't believe that there's certainly no mutual exclusivity, but uh, they're connected in some way. But I think they both were tumbling down around the same time. But I don't think it contributed uh, to its downfall. Really, America this changing socioeconomic and equality status uh, really was the was the engine that drove that. And our last question, what was it about Buffalo that nurtured the Larkin humanitarian approach to running a business? I don't know if it was Buffalo per se, but it certainly was, I think in general terms, you know, that sort of fraternity was was uh, a, a thing uh, across the world, I, I would say at that time, or at least in Western civilization, so to speak. Uh, you know, a lot of focus on like the Greek gods and you know, things like that and uh, musicals and operas. Uh, I think really the driver is William Heath there, who also has the Frank Lloyd Wright house there. Uh, he was a real believer in, you know, the the, uh, I don't know what the word is, but about work, uh, the sanctity of work, the satisfaction of work and being upstanding citizens and looking out for uh, your brother and sister uh, and your coworkers and things like that. So I don't think Buffalo was specific to that, uh, but he brought that with him. And he really, as a vice president, he really instituted that thread throughout the newsletters and throughout the catalogs that uh, the customers would get. And certainly then it was embraced by Darwin Martin and working with Frank Lloyd Wright and in including that into the architecture of the Larkin administration book. Thank you. Well, Jane, I'm going to uh, ask you, uh, uh, is your, does your book hold a lot of this component uh, that we're discussing the, the social progress and uh, that and the ideas that uh, especially William Heath brought to the table. Is there a section of your book on the Larkin Company that does that? Yeah, I do have a chapter is on the social welfare program. So I go into much greater detail than I could today. Uh, it goes, uh, it, so it goes into greater detail in that chapter, correct? Okay, and in, including uh, the role of William Heath, because I think that's, that's worth us knowing here in town. So yeah. we'll, we'll follow up on that. Again, we're gonna bring you back in the fall in October uh, right. uh, uh, to uh, talk about industry on the east side. Uh, again, all part of our celebration of Erie County 200, uh, this uh, 200th anniversary. So uh, stay tuned, every one of our programs at the Imagine Series will try to connect with that celebration. So folks, thank you for joining us today. Uh, join us next week, same time, same Zoom link, uh, uh, when we talk with Joan Bozer and friends about Canal Side's vintage solar carousel. Uh, it's, uh, it's almost here. Uh, all set to go and, um, and uh, be enjoyed by us and, and uh, hopefully a lot of folks from beyond Buffalo. So I'm Dennis Galecki. Be well and have a good day. Great, thank you so much, Dennis. Thank you, Shane. Yes, you're welcome.
So I'll give you a buzz in a few minutes. Here now. Okay, thank you. Bye, everybody.